Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We bless your name for bringing us here. Thank you for your people, always ready, always open to learn from your word and to study together. We're asking, Lord, tonight to reach our lives with your word in Jesus' name. Grant us understanding. Grant us illumination. And we we'll pray, Lord, that the revelation of your word will make a deep and great impact, unforgettable, lasting impact in every life tonight in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we we'll pray. Please open your Bible with me to Mark chapter 11. Tonight we're looking at Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through to 11. Mark 11 from verse 1. And when he came near to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way, unto the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a cold tide, whereon never man sat, loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord has need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. And he went their way and found the cold tide by the door without in a place where your ways met. And he loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the cult? And he said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and he let them go. And they brought the cult to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon, upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches of the trees, and strode them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the even tide was come, he went out unto Bethany of the toil. That passage tells us about Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Actually, many people had been waiting for redemption in Israel. They had been waiting for the coming of the king. And some of them had expressed the certainty, the knowledge, the revelation that they had, and they affirmed that this is the king of Israel. That's according to the Old Testament prophecy. And what we have read today, Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem had been something expected in the Old Testament. If you look at Sephaniah chapter 3, Sephaniah chapter 3, reading there from verse 15, it tells us of their expectation. The Lord has taken away thy judgment. He has cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil 
anymore. And so they were expecting that the king will come. That king is the Messiah. That king is Christ. And they were expecting that one day he will come and enter into Jerusalem. And they will know the deliverance from their enemy had come. Zechariah tells us even the exact way it will happen. Zechariah chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9. Reading from verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a coach of the fowl of an of the fall of an ass. You can see that this exactly pictures what happened at that time that Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. And some other people had also recognized him even before this time that he is the king of Israel. And is the king of Israel. They want to come and they want to deliver them and they want to redeem them. They want to save them, the king of Israel that is going to ride triumphantly into the city. Look at the affirmation that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, was known and affirmed as the king of Israel. John chapter 1, reading from verse 49. John chapter 1, verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, thou art the Son of God, and we know this, thou art the King of Israel. The Son of God and the King of Israel. Look at Matthew chapter 21. The King of Israel riding triumphantly and riding victoriously into Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 21, reading from verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, it tells us, it says in verse 4, All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt of the full of an ass. You'll see then that this was prophesied. The king, the king of Israel, the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, the king, the Messiah, will ride triumphantly into the city Jerusalem. And what's the description of this kind of king that will ride into the city of Jerusalem? We're looking at Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And we're reading from verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Say to them that of a fearful heart be strong, fear not. Behold, your king will come with vengeance. And even, even king, even God with a recompense. Look at this. He will come and save you. He will come and save you. And the time has now come that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, to the, the son of David, Hosanna, into the name of the one that is to come. Tonight we're looking at this passage teaching on Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Three parts we're going to consider as we look at the passage. Number one, the predicted arrival of the true king. Many kings had come and he could not deliver them. They could not save them and they could not get them redeemed out of their sin, out of their suffering, out of their captivity, out of their slavery, and out of their deprivation, out of the oppression of the Roman government. But now the true king had come and this was predicted even before his arrival. Number one, the predicted arrival of the, of the true king. Number two, the preview the previewed approval of the trusted king. 
Actually, it wasn't at this time. It began to rain. He had told them over and over, we go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles and of the Jews as well. They will betray him. They will kill him. He'll be buried. On the third day, he will rise again. But this is the trusted king. He's the one to come and is the one to reign over Israel. Not only over Israel, over the whole earth. But what we see today in this passage of scripture is the preview of the approval of God that this is the king, the trusted king. No, number two, the previewed approval of the trusted king. Number three, the perceptive appraisal of the triumphant king. This is the triumphant king, but he wasn't deceived by all the shouting. He wasn't deceived by all their celebration. He wasn't deceived by all their kind of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know why? Because he could perceive. He could appraise the whole situation. He could evaluate the whole situation. And so he came to Jerusalem. You would have thought, once he entered into Jerusalem with such splendor, and with such shouting and with such acceptance of the people, he will go either to the seat of government and then he will declare something. No, he didn't. You will think that he'll appear before the Sanhedrin and declare, you have heard what the people have said, I have come to take over. No, he didn't. You will think, he will tell his disciples, now is the time for the king to reign. No, he didn't. We're told in verse 11. Look at verse 11. And Jesus, that's Mark chapter 11, verse 11. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. That he is triumph, triumphing over everything and walking over all the things they put on the ground. And he walked majestically into Jerusalem. But look at this. And into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now it was even tide, even tide was come, he went out of Bethany. He went out unto Bethany with the toil. He looked at everything he perceived. He knew the hearts of the people. He knew the condition of the nation. And he knew this was not the time. He appraised everything. He knew the time was still to come. When he will reign as king over the land and over the world. The perceptive appraisal of the triumphant king. Point number one. The predicted arrival of the true king. Let's come back to Mark. Chapter 1, chapter 11, reading from verse 1. Mark chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And when they came nice to Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples, and he says unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a cult tied whereon never man sat, lose him and bring him. You can see his knowledge here, and you can see the revelation here. We call it the word of knowledge. He wasn't there, he had not gone there, and yet he knew. As he sent those two disciples, what they will get, what they will see when they got there. And then he told them, this is the place you'll get it. And man has never sat upon that earth. How did he know? Word of knowledge. That's the gift of the Spirit in his life. Because the Bible says, the Spirit of God was given unto him without measure. Look at verse uh, 3. And if any man say unto you, What do ye this? Say ye that the Lord has need of him. And straightway immediately he will send him thither. He had not discussed with the man. He didn't make, make any previous arrangement with the man. And yet he knew when those disciples get there and they lose their eyes and they lose the cold, somebody is going to ask them, 
he knew that he had the knowledge that this was going to happen. And when they asked you like that, just tell them, the Lord has need of him. And they went their way. And the disciples were obedient, they were submissive, they didn't question. And we just go to somebody's uh, yard or somebody's house and then be losing the ass and they're going to ask us a question. Isn't that going to be embarrassing? The disciples never question the Lord. Whatever he says unto you, do it. That's actually why those disciples of old, they had more prayers answered. That's why they had their lives transformed. That's why they saw great, great wonders and signs and miracles that many people do not see today. Whenever the Lord spoke to them, is the Lord of heaven and earth, is the King of glory, is the King of the earth, is the King on heaven and here. All power in heaven on earth is given unto him. They submitted unto him. They went their way and found the cold tide by the door without in the outside in a place where two ways met and they lose him. They didn't go to somebody taking permission. Can we do this? Can we do this? The, the Almighty God at the sent his only begotten son and his only begotten son, the coming king, I told them what to do and that they did and certain of them in verse 5 that stood there sent unto them what do ye lose in the cult? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded. And they said unto them, Even as Jesus has commanded. We need to know more of the word of Christ. Because the word of Christ will always take effect will always be powerful, will always be mighty. When you speak that word to your neighbor, that word will take effect. When you speak that word to sickness, that word will take effect. When you speak that word to evil personalities, the word of Christ, the King of Israel, the King of the earth, that word will take effect. When you speak that word to Satan, who might come to tempt you and to try you, and you say, it is reaching, that word will take effect. They spoke the same word that Christ has spoken to them. If any man asks you, what do ye, losing that cult, just tell them this, and they will release. Look at it, it says, as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the cult to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon that cult. How is that? That had been predicted long ago in the word of God. And they went according to that prediction of the word. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And I'm reading from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 43. We're reading from verse 15. It says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, and your King. I'm your King. And because the King, he has ownership of everything. He has ownership of the village. He has ownership of the community. He has ownership of the whole earth. He has ownership of the man that owns the ass of the cult. He is your King. And he says, look at verse, uh, verse 18, Remember not ye the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. It was a new thing to the disciples that Jesus will take him, you know, an ass like that, a colt like that, and ride upon it. But that's the king. And the king will always do a new thing. And once he becomes the king of your life, new, new things will happen every day. You might think that you had seen everything Christ could do, everything Christ could have done. But it becomes the Lord, the Redeemer, the King of your life. You'll see new things. I said you'll see new things. In verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We're coming to Hosea chapter 13. Predicted arrival of the true king. It is true king. All the kings that came before him to Israel, 
they couldn't really fully um, deliver the children of Israel. They did a little that he could do. David did a little that he could do. After his death, the Philistines continued tormenting the people. And then um, Solomon did whatever he could do. And after he had gone, the enemies were tormenting the people. It's the true king that comes finally. It's the true king that comes with power. And when he comes, all problems are solved. He comes to Israel, and then when they allow him to reign as the king, all their challenges will eventually finally be removed. And, but for now, they have not allowed him. You allow him in your heart, and every problem is solved in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Hosea chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 9. Looking at verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy hell. O Israel, you have destroyed yourself, but in me is thy help, is thy help. I will be thy king. Will you allow him to be the king and he rides into your life? All those problems are solved. He says, where is any other that may save thee in all thy sieges and thy judges of whom thou says, give me a king and a Princes, it says, is the real one. We're coming to Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Zechariah chapter uh, 9. We're reading from verses 9 and 10. We're getting near now to the New, New Testament. We're getting near to when Christ himself will come. And as we get near to when Christ will come, the revelation becomes clearer. The revelation becomes plainer. The revelation becomes so open that now they knew that the king was coming. And when he comes, here is what will happen. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Rejoice, not just rejoice, but rejoice greatly. Daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. How shall we know when he comes? Because every, everybody passes through the gate of the city and comes into the city. Here is how you will know that that is the king, the expected king, the predicted king, and the true king, and the one that will fulfill all the revelations of the true king. Here is how you will know. Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly riding upon an ass and upon a coach of the full of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. It says when he comes and you allow him to reign supreme, you allow him to reign without a rival, you allow him to reign without any reservation. It said the, the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace is a prince of peace unto, uh, unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. That's the prediction that will come and when it comes this is what will happen. The question is did the Jews understand? The question is that the nation understand? The question is, even his disciples at this time, when all these things happened, did they recollect, did they remember that this is what will happen when the king arrived? Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 15. John chapter 12. Let's back up to verse 13. In John chapter 12, reading from verse 13. They took branches of palm, of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found young ass, sat thereon as 
it is written, predicted, as it is written, prophesied. And now the fulfillment has come. He sat upon that as uh, the as is called, as it is written. Look at verse uh, 15. There fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Look at verse 16. The question is, did Israel understand this is the king? Did uh, the, the, the Jews understand this is the king? And did uh, the leaders of the people understand this is the king? Did his own disciples themselves, did they understand this is the true king to come? Look at verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. If the disciples did not understand, how were the Jewish people that were not saved, how would they understand? If the disciples did not understand, how were the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the people, how would they understand? If the disciples did not understand, how will the nation, how would they understand? It says in verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. When he rose from the dead, and when he was glorified, then they recollected, look at those things that happened. And look at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And they began to compare the Old, Old Testament scriptures in Zephaniah, in Zechariah, in Isaiah, and other places in the Old Testament. And now they understood. You will understand now. I said you will understand. Understanding will bring blessing into your life in Jesus' name. Before I move on from that point number one, let's come back to Mark chapter 11 mark chapter 11 and i'm reading here from verse 3 mark chapter 11 verse 3 and if any man say unto you why do ye this say ye that the lord has need of him and straightway he will send him hither say ye that the lord has need of him and straightway he will send that as hither say unto them that the lord the king of israel has need of him has need of her has need of it and straightway immediately without argument without reservation they will release that because it belongs to the lord Look at that critically and understand. It says in verse 2, at the end of verse 2, whereon never man sat. Whereon never man sat. That ass in particular was not created, was not brought into the world because the ass was to serve man. Even though it came to the compound of that man, it was not for that man. Even though it came to that family, it was not for that family. Whereon never man sat. Bring him, if anybody challenges you, just say, the Lord has need of him. Have you ever thought about yourself? Why were you created? For what purpose do you come to this world? Why were you saved? Why did you become a child of God? Are you for the world? Are you for the community? Are you for the profession? Are you for this or that? The answer is the Lord has need of you. Thank God he has need of me. There's something so valuable in you, he has need of you. There's something so essential in you, he has need of you. And when the call comes to you, bring him unto me. Bring her unto me. You will not resist because you know, here is the purpose of your creation. That's why you are living. The Lord has need of him. Look at Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. We're reading from verse 21. These people have I formed for myself. I need them. 
I need them. There are some people who are wondering, what am I to do on earth? Why am I here on earth? Why should I get saved? Why should I get sanctified? Why should I come to the Lord? Why should I serve the Lord? Why should I worship the Lord? He created you exactly for that purpose. The people, these people, have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. We're looking at Psalm 4, and we're reading from verse 3. Always have the consciousness, the Lord has need of me, the Lord has need of her, the Lord has need of him. That, that's why if the call comes to your child, that he should give his life to the Lord, you will not hinder your child, the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need of her. If the call comes to your wife, that you should serve the Lord, consecrate to the Lord, and serve the Lord without any reservation in righteousness and holiness from that point on to the rest of her life, you will not discourage her. The Lord has need of her. And if the call comes to your husband, and the Lord is laying his hand upon your husband, and your husband at home in the quiet time in the family devotion begins to say, Yes, I know I'm saved. Yes, I know I'm sanctified. I want to leave uh, this uh, lucrative job. I want to serve the Lord. You will not, uh, you know, be hindering your husband saying, oh, you're going to do that. What are we going to have and this and that? The Lord has promoted you. Don't you think that this is an answer to prayer? The Lord has need of him and we will release whoever that has that coach, that child, that daughter, that wife, that husband to the Lord fully and completely so that the Lord will make use of them for the purpose he created them in Jesus' name. And yourself, when the Lord calls you, you will answer, here am I. Yourself, when the Lord lays his hand upon you, I have need of you. I have need of you. You will not say, but I about that other one, that they don't do in everything. I about that other one, I did not do in everything. When the Lord calls you, you will answer in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 4. I'm looking at verse 3. Psalm 4, reading from verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. He has set apart him that is godly not for the world, not to improve the world, not to educate the world, not to raise up the world, not to labor and sweat for the world, because the world eventually is going to be destroyed. Everything is going to come through a fire. And everything, all the elements will be burnt. But you are so special in his sight that he says, I will ride on you into Jerusalem. I will ride on you into your community. I will ride on you into your tribe. Know this, that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call upon him. Somebody said amen there. Look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. Uh, there is this man, his name Saul. He didn't know why he was created. He was fighting the purpose of his creation. He was uh, contradicting the purpose of his creation. But eventually, the voice came. Eventually, the call came. And you realize, now I understand. Now I understand why God created me, why God talented me, why God gave me skill, why God gave me courage, why God gave me all the drive I have within me. Now I understand. Look at Galatians chapter 1 in verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him him among the heathen immediately when I realized the call came to me and the voice said I have need of you the Lord has need of him immediately I confide not of flesh and blood I pray that that same earnestness and that same response that will respond to the Lord immediately you will not hold back you will not pull back 
and as he tells you that he has need of you like the owner of that ass they called like they released everything to those two disciples to take the ass and the colt unto jesus as you realize he has need of you you will do the same in jesus name in first corinthians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 19 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Have you ever thought about your body? My body, my health, my beauty, my handsomeness, my skill, my power, my, my native ability, my courage, and my vision, and my passion. Uh -uh. You've gone astray. Don't you know that you are the temple and the property of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? He made you for a purpose. He saved you for a purpose, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God. That's why you are living. Wherefore glorify God, that's why you are alive, therefore glorify God, that's why you are in the kingdom, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We'll come to point number two now, the previewed approval of the trusted king. We're coming to Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 8. All through to verse 10. Mark chapter 11, reading from verse 8. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches of the trees, and stretch them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed after, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they were actually saying, save us, redeem us. We come under your authority, under your royalty. Under your supremacy, Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, redeem us. Hosanna, set us free. Break the iron hold and the iron oppression of, uh, the, of the foreign government over us. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 24. Then you understand what we were talking about. You understand what they were expecting? In Luke chapter 24, we're reading from verse 21, when he cried, Hosanna, save us, our King, save us, our Redeemer, deliver us from foreign power, foreign government. Look at this, chapter 24 of Luke, verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We trusted. Uh, what kind of trust is that? What are you thinking of? Salvation? Sanctification? What are you thinking of holiness? What are they thinking of he taking them to heaven? Not really. What are they thinking of? What they thought of when they asked for the first king? What did they think of when they asked for the first king? Let's come to first Samuel. First Samuel. The idea, the art, the understanding, the art about, uh, you know, when this king will come and we trust it, that he is the one that will redeem us, that will save us, that will deliver us. For Samuel, we're reading from chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 19. For Samuel, chapter 8, reading from verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. They wanted the king. And now that Jesus appeared, opening the eyes of the blind, 
and making the dead to hear and healing all sicknesses, all the people that were oppressed of the devil, he delivered them, he redeemed them, and he saved them from their sicknesses. They thought, this must be the king, this must be the Messiah, this must be the Christ. What are we doing under the Roman power, under the Roman government, under the Roman uh, oppression? When this crisis is here, Hosanna, save us, and we acknowledge your kingship and royalty. You are thinking of deliverance from the Roman government. Look at verse 20, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles and fight our battles that's why they were surprised as the lord jesus christ rode triumphantly into the into jerusalem and then they cried hosanna everybody shouted save us redeem us deliver us this is the time this uh, Roman government will not continue oppressing us. Then he entered. After he entered, he looked around and then he left and went to Bethany. Why? Why have you done that? That's the kind of uh, anticlimax of the whole situation of the day. We thought that you had come and we trusted that you would have delivered us out of the hands of the Roman power. But understand, here is a trusted king. And what they were doing was an approval of what will happen in the future. This was only a preview, a preview of what will happen in the future. We're coming to Psalm 2. Here is the real king. Here is the trusted king. Here is the ordained king. Here is the king anointed to save the nation of Israel and to save the world. But not the kind of salvation they were looking for. We're looking at Psalm 2 and we're reading from verse 6. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Israelites, the Israelites did not understand yet have i said my king the jewish people didn't understand when that rain will come yet have i said my king i will declare the decree the lord has said unto me thou art my son this day have i begotten thee it's an affirmation of the approval that this is the coming king and this is the trusted king but they thought now take over the kingdom now take Take, take over the polity. Now take over from the Roman government. Not like that. We're looking at Psalm 45. Psalm 45, the approval of the trusted king. And this was just a preview, a preview of that approval. We're looking at Psalm 45. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 45. Verse 6, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. It's not a temporary thing, it's throne. It's not an earthly thing, it's throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is the right scepter. Look at this. Thou lovest righteousness and hateth wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, therefore, God, thy Father, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Is a trusted king, is a true king. And yet, when he will reign, was still in the future, all that we see in the study today is a preview of the approved trusted king. We're looking at Psalm 89. Psalm 89, we're reading here from verse, um, reading from verse 36, 89, verse 36. In verse 36, his siege shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me, the throne of this king. The king of kings and the lord of lords. The true king, the trusted king, the one anointed, appointed, approved of the father. With a, whose a preview of reigning we see today, that it will, the throne will continue as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon. 
and as a faithful witness in heaven. As a faithful witness in heaven. Psalm 110, 110. We're reading from verse 1. Psalm 110, reading from verse 1. The Lord has said unto my Lord, you see, Lord, there two times, the Lord, that's God the Father, has said unto my Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see that the way the Lord is reaching in the fourth, all capital, and then the next one, because the Son is next to the Father, a reaching with capital L and small letters, O-R-D, the Lord God in heaven has said unto my Lord Jesus Christ, seek thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of, of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. But remember, it's still that ruling is still to be in the future. And when he comes and he rules in the future, that's when actually they'll be able to say, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Look at Psalm 118. In Psalm 118, we're reading from verse 25. And you will see exactly the words they were quoting. They were quoting that from the prophecy in the Psalms. Look at Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now. That's Hosanna. Save us now. Deliver us now. Set us free now. Save now. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Look at verse 26. Are you there? I said, Are you there? Read verse 26 from the beginning, one, two, three, go. Do you see that? That's exactly what they were saying. It's a preview of what will still happen. It was not to happen at that time, finally and fully and eternally. It says in verse 26, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And eventually, uh, they said that as a preview. Understand that from the very beginning of Revelation that Christ was to come, he was to reign, he was to rule, and he was to be the king. Uh, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government, the rulership, the royalty, the supremacy will be upon his shoulder. This is the true king, and this is the trusted king, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, he's going to have the government, and he's going to be the head of that government, he's going to be the king of Israel, and the king of the whole universe, of the, of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end. There shall be no end upon the throne of David. That's, that's what they said. Blessed be the son of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Somebody shout Amen. It's not the ideology of Israel that will perform this. It's not the fecal understanding of the children of Israel that will perform this. It's not the religious hierarchy of Israel that will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Look at Daniel. Christ is the king and is going to reign, is going to rule forever and ever. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7. 
Daniel chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, we're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. That's his title. That's Jesus Christ. I beheld and I saw one like unto the, on the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. The time is coming when Christ, when he comes again, when he comes back, and he's going to come over the clouds. Not the time he came through the manger, and the time he came through Mary. Not the time he came through the inn, but at this time now, he's going to come with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days, that's the almighty God, ancient of days, and they brought him the Son of Man, near before him, the Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Somebody shout amen. Which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Is coming. I said it's coming. But to see at that time, as I've read you, let me remind you again, we read it before, let's read it again in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, at that time, his disciples did not understand. That's why they were asking the question, will you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? You have died, you were buried, you rose again, and now you appear unto us with many infallible proofs. Is this the time? They, they didn't understand that the Gentiles are still who hear the gospel. They didn't understand that Jesus is going to still bring in, even, he, even though he told them, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must bring. They didn't remember that. They said, well, you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel, and then you will reign. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the time or the season that God has put in his own hand. But go and tarry in Jerusalem, and you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. They didn't understand that that was not the time of the final fulfillment of his being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let, let's come to John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 13. John chapter 12, verse 13. The Duke branches of uh, palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Je and Jesus, when uh, he had found a young ass, such thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting upon uh, an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first when it happened. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were reaching of him, and that they had done these things on they had done these things unto him. Let's come to now point number three. We're coming to Mark chapter eleven. Mark chapter eleven. We're reading from verse eleven. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple and when he had looked round about upon all things and now the even tide was come he went out unto bethany with the twelve why this kind of anticlimax why didn't christ go immediately to the seat of government take over their politics and to the seat of religion take over all the temple worship and declare himself and the righteous king and the reigning king and the ruling king and all the other people that have usurped my authority I put them down I announce and I'm going to set everything right at this time 
because point number three now the perceptive appraisal by the triumphant king christ looked round about he appraised everything he evaluated everything he saw all the had all the shouting hosanna to the uh, to the uh, to the king hosanna uh, in the highest and they said hosanna uh, to the king blessed be the kingdom of our father david that comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest he heard he looked around he left them and went out of jerusalem unto bethany you know why he perceived he understood this was not their first time they had had something like that before look at john john chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 15 john chapter 6 we're reading from verse 15 it tells us in verse 15 chapter uh, chapter 6 and when jesus therefore perceived perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king he departed again into a mountain place himself alone why he knew that wasn't the time he knew they didn't have a good heart he knew they didn't have the right attitude he knew that they were coming for the for the force for uh, for the wrong reason and therefore when they would have come to make him a king by force he went out and he went by himself alone eventually they found him where he went look at verse 25 in verse 25 and when they had found him on the other side of the sea they said unto him rabbi teacher master when camest thou hither and then and jesus answered them and said verily i say unto you you seek me not because you saw the miracles not because you saw that the miracles are proved of me and i am the king and i got some time i will reign it's not because you want me to reign in your heart and reign in your family and reign in your home it's not because you want me to reign in your character reign in your conduct and reign in your lifestyle but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled your people of the belly you are worshiping for your belly you're praying for your belly you're seeking after me because of eating loaves of bread and you were filled verse 27 labor not for the meat which perishes but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life which the son of man shall give unto you for him as a father sealed eventually you know when he told them the truth they didn't continue to follow that's what was saying he perceived their heart he perceived their mind he perceived how superficial they were how fecal they were look at that same chapter and look at uh, verse uh, verse 16 verse 60 many therefore of his disciples of those who are running after him of those who are saying when did you come here of those who are saying he must be the king we must force him we must make him the king right now many of those people when they had had this said this is an hard seen who can receive it look at verse 66 from that time many of his disciples so-called disciples went back and they walked no more with him they saw he wasn't ready to only be ministering to their belly only ministering to their body they saw that he wasn't just interested to deliver us from the roman government is not it's not interested in the politics of the day and he's not interested in solving the problems of the day he wants to wait for the time of the father when he will be the king and so they were not interested and they went away uh, they went away from him look at john chapter 2 john chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 24 and verse 25 john chapter 2 verse 24 verse 25 but jesus did not commit himself unto them 
because he knew all men. All these people that are shouting, is a miracle worker, is the great provider, is our supplier, and we love him. He's going to be our King Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the one that comes. He did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, uh, have you noticed that you know, they, they thought and they said, This is the king, this is the king. Uh, but look at, look at this. Well, we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 22. We're reading from verse 16. Uh, they wanted to test him out. They wanted to find out whether he has the understanding that if a king is going to be upon us, he must deliver us from Caesar. Look at this in uh, Matthew chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 16. In verse 16, and they sent out unto him their disciples. The disciples say, uh, Well, the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person, the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Is it right to give tribute unto Caesar? We are the people of God and the descendants of Abraham. Is it right for a foreign government, Roman man, to be ruling over us? And Jesus, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. Jesus perceived the wickedness. That's why we're making point number three. They perceived a prisoner, a, a prisoner by the triumphant king. And then he said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And he brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose image and superscription is this? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they heard, they had heard these things, these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. But you know, that idea, Caesar, never left their mind. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, they perceived that he had the wisdom. He answered them. He dismissed them. And is not competing with Caesar to take over the earthly government and rule over them. Look at Luke chapter 23 in verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give a tribute to Caesar. See that. See that. That was what, what was in their mind. That was the answer they expected from Jesus Christ, that he will say, don't give tribute to Caesar. I am your king. And then they'll pick that up. But he didn't say that. He said, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that belong to God, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, are thou, uh, art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest. Then said Pilate to the, to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, said unto them, He yeah, brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people and behold i haven't examined him before you have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him no nor yet herod 
For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. And let's look at John chapter 19. You see their mind, you see their evil. John chapter 19, we're reading from verse 12. John chapter 19, verse 12. It tells us, they tell us in verse 12, verse 12 says, and from, his, and from his forth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew tongue, Gabbatha. And it goes on in verse 14. And it was in the preparation, it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he says unto the Jews, Behold your king. But he cried out, A way was him, a way was him, a way was him, crucify him. I want to remind you, this was barely a week after Hosanna. When they shout Hosanna, that was the beginning of the week. As they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, that's the end of the same week. The people, they were superficial. They didn't mean what they were saying. They didn't understand what they were saying. When they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, before that week ran out, in verse 15, they said, crucify him. And Pilate says unto them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. We learn something here. The Lord will not depend upon the shouting of the people to make him king, and they are rushing after him to make him king. Look at the wisdom of God that is telling, that is telling us in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, here is the wisdom of God that as Jesus perceived the superficiality of the people, God will grant you, will grant me, will grant us perception in Jesus' name. As long as you are giving the people the bread and the meat and the water and the material things and the clothing and all those things you give them, they will shout to Sana. They shout, blessed is the name of the Lord. They shout, you are our leader. They will shout, you are our king. It's, they will shout, you are our mother in Israel. You are our father in the Lord. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about people who are not born again. Thank God you are born again. I said, thank God we are born again. But you know the people of the world, once you are giving them this and that, and once you say, that's not the important thing, salvation. Knowing the Lord is the important thing. Then they will turn around, they will say, well, we didn't even realize it's a bad man, it's a bad woman. Crucify him, crucify her. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 2. We're reading from verse 22. Cease from man. They'll flatter you. Cease from man. They will smile at you, cease from man. They will praise you, they will honor you, cease from man. They will cry, you son, and cease from man. They will say, blessed is he that cometh. The Lord has sent you, and we know that you are going to be a king. Cease from man, whose breath is in his nostrils, wherein is he to be accounted of. You will not put all your trust in man. Jesus knew that God will make him king and not man. And he looked up to God, you will look up to God. Every good thing you will, you will get, you look up to God. Promotion, you look up to God. Royalty, you look up to God. Blessing, you will look up to God. Man will disappoint. If uh, somebody is promising you, I will do this, I will do that, and then you abandon worship and you abandon God because now what I was looking for, Mr. So and so said, I shall come, and then etc. And he gave me an appointment at the time of the Bible study. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot go to Bible study today. I'm going to that man. He promised me, 
you'll be disappointed, you'll be, you'll be so, you'll be shocked in your life. You will not abandon the Lord for the men of this world in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 118, Psalm 118, I'm reading there from verse 8 and from verse 9. Psalm 118, look at verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. You'll put your confidence in God. You'll put your trust in God. He'll promise you heaven and earth. They'll promise you sky and ocean. They'll promise you bread and butter. They'll promise you material things. They'll say, why are you praying? Why are you fasting? Why are you looking up to God? Why are you going to church? Everything you are looking for, going to church, I will give you. Uh -uh. They cannot give us everything we're looking for. Can, can they give us salvation? Can they give us grace? Can they give us holiness? Can they give us, can they put our name in the book of life? Can they give us heaven? Answer me, church. It is better to put, uh, uh, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put, uh, than to put confidence in princes. Your heart will be of the Lord. I said your heart will be for the Lord. Look at Psalm 37, Psalm 37. I'm reading from verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 3. Trust in the Lord. You want salvation? Trust in the Lord. You want holiness? Trust in the Lord. You want the supply of all the needs of your life? Trust in the Lord. You want anything? Promotion, exaltation, honor. Trust in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall thou dwell in the land. Your life will be secured and safe in Jesus' name. Verily, thou shalt be fed. In whatever austerity, whatever poverty, whatever the economy, the Lord will feed you. Remember, he has need of you. He has need of your life. He must feed you. He must take care of you. Verily, certainly, thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will, he will shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You miss a great amen there. You delight yourself in the Lord. You don't delight in all these people that are shouting on the streets. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed you see that comment in the name of the Lord. And they're just a crowd. They're just a multitude. They don't mean what they say. After in, in one week, they're going to turn around and they're going to shout, crucify him. But delight also thyself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desire of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and it shall bring it to pass. And it shall bring it to pass. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He put his trust in the Lord and now it has come to pass in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He tells us in verse 9, Wherefore God has highly exalted him. He has done it already. Man cannot do it. Israel could not do it. The nations could not do it. But the Almighty God did it for him. The Almighty God will do it for you. Wherefore God has highly exalted Exalted him and given him a name. Nobody can do this, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in the earth and of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue will eventually confess. The Almighty God will do that. The Almighty God will make it possible. It will happen. Is the true king, it will happen. Is the trusted king, it will happen. Is the triumphant king, it will happen in Jesus' name. And everything you are to have in exaltation, everything you are to have in promotion, everything will happen to you from the hand of the Lord. Man that is fickle and dependable, they will not do it, but God, the God of heaven, will do it for you, will do it for us in Jesus' name.
it will happen and eventually we'll see that the whole world and the whole earth will be under the leadership, under the rulership, under the supremacy, under the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and, his, and, his, uh, and on his head were many crowns, and he had the name written that no man knew but himself, and he, sh and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in, in a fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and would that with it he shall smite the nations, and that it shall rule, rule, reign, upon reign with a, with a rod of iron, and it treadeth the winepress of the of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty, and he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written, a name written. Somebody shout out the name. Say that again. Finally, King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus will reign. It's the Father that will make it happen, not that crowd, not that crowd, they are undependable, and Jesus perceived. And then he went into the temple, he looked round about, this one's a fickle, this one are faithless, this one are counterfeit, this one's, they don't mean what they say, he left them the Father eventually will make him King of kings and Lord of lords. And you, a child of God, and you believe, and you save, sanctify, feel what the Holy Ghost, everything the Lord has for you, he will give unto you. I don't mind all the crowd that you know that are saying, well, we'll give you, forget about God, forget this, but God himself will honor you. God himself will promote you. Look away from man. They cannot fulfill their promises. Look unto God. Everything you ordained that you will be, you will be in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. He's taught us today about uh, all this triumphal entry. And now we need to take that to the Lord in prayer. So that everything we ought to have from him, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost, baptism, supply, everything he will give unto you in Jesus' name.